everyone, and welcome to the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. This is the host of the podcast, Tom Brady. I'm the Associate Dean for the Homeland Security Training Institute here at the College of DuPage. And on this podcast, we like to talk about all things related to Homeland Security. Uh, We hope that you uh, enjoy these podcasts. We try to do different topics and different uh, guests coming on talking about their role in Homeland Security. And today we have a really exciting guest to talk with us today. We have Dave Beeman. Dave is the Vice President of Quality and Support with Andy Frayne Services. And a little bit a little bit about Dave. Dave is a certified protection professional, board certified in security management by ASIS International, with more than 25 years of corporate and contract security experience, including providing services for commercial, cultural, and government facilities, foreign heads of state, large public gatherings, sporting events, and special security events as designated by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And Dave's joining us today from downtown Chicago, where he's involved in the security planning for the NFL experience in Grant Park today, which is prior to the Bears-Packers game. So all your Bear fans out there, Dave is downtown getting things ready for the NFL experience, and we're thrilled to have him on the show. Dave, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're really thrilled to have you. I know that you're really busy today, so I really appreciate you joining us. And we're going to talk about what you do in event security, um, screening at these events, uh, a lot of things about what you do in your role. Um, We're also excited because uh, you're also an adjunct faculty member at the Homeland Security Training Institute. And we have a a class coming up on September 16th, which is really, really going to be a fantastic class. So we're going to talk about that as well. But Dave, to get started, can you tell us a little bit about what your role in the NFL experience down at Grand Park is today? So we're the private security contractor for the NFL and their 2019 kickoff event here in Grant Park. Um, our role is primarily to ensure access and perimeter control of the event to include the manning of their security checkpoints. Uh, security checkpoints are where the general fans will be entering. Um, it is a free event for the public, um, but we will be manning those checkpoints to make sure that no prohibited items get through. So we'll be screening each of these um, fans for through by walk-through metal detectors, handheld metal detectors, physical search, and x-ray. And this being the 100th anniversary of the NFL, I would imagine this is going to be a really big event for the NFL. And in, in terms of people attending this, now you mentioned it's a free event. Is there any idea of how many people that may be attending this today? They estimate that the, uh, the venue will hold 40,000 people. Wow. So it'll be, a, it'll be a big crowd. And I think it's important... The work that you do, I know the 100th anniversary of the, actually the, the, the Bears' 100th anniversary as well as the NFL's 100th anniversary. I think that's, that's pretty exciting. And in your career, Dave, you've directed security screening at some major events over the years. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your role and, and, and security screening in general and maybe some things that people don't know about security screening? Well, I'll start kind of at the beginning. The very first event that I was responsible for security screening was um, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama's visit to Millennium Park in, uh, oh, that was 2005 when he came, if I remember correctly. Um, And as the director of security for Millennium Park at the time, I had really no idea where to go about finding equipment, where to go about finding people to staff it, you know, how we were going to run it, any of that stuff. So, the that kind of research into getting that done is kind of where my the launch point for my career. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed over over my time across the country, and I've you know screened people from California to to Florida to New York, and down to down to Texas, all over the all over the country. Um, there's kind of a misconception out there that simply handing a security officer a, a metal detector um, or telling them to search a bag, they're going to know exactly what they're doing. Um, and how to and how to do it and and nothing could be further from the truth. It is something that needs to be planned. It is something that needs to be organized. It is something that needs to be trained, and it is something that needs to be managed in order for it to be effective. Is there any event uh, or one event that stands out in your mind of all the events that you've been a, a part of, Dave, that you felt was the most challenging for whatever reason? 
Oh, there's there, there's many. Uh, the United States Golf Association, uh, the USGA, their their annual U, annual U.S. Open, uh, being one of those, and that was because we were screening and they could not allow cell phones into the venue. Of course, everybody carried a cell phone at the time. They've right. since relaxed that restriction, uh, but that was particularly challenging because you're dealing now with people who are highly upset that they can't bring their prized iPhone into a into a secured venue, and they had to therefore you know check it. I'm sorry. There's actually places that you'd be able to check something. I mean, you wouldn't have to walk back to your car to put that away. Can they can they, you know, leave it at the event and pick it up afterwards? That always varies from event to event to event. Typically speaking, um, as security officers do not have a right to search or seizure, we rely completely on the consent of the uh, of the owner, the person that's being screened. So if they have something in their possession, typically they're only going to have two choices with that item. One take it away, meaning they take it back to their car, they take it back to their home, or they throw it away. They dispose of it at the item so they can enter. Um, Some venues may set up a system by which they can actually check that item, get a claim ticket, and return it. Uh, The USGA is one of those at select checkpoints, depending on how far away somebody might be from their vehicle or whether or not they're brought in by bus. Um, The University of Alabama, for example, has what they refer to as a prohibited item area. It's kind of a, a brick pit that people can just kind of dump their stuff in and hope that it's still there when they when they get back there is no check Uh, but other venues will typically only give them the two choices take it away or throw it away okay you mentioned 40,000 people coming to this nfl experience event in downtown chicago today um what does that rank in terms of size of events that you you've screened at is it small or what's the largest event that you've been a part of well, the biggest single-day screening event that we do is the University of Alabama football. They've got 105,000 seating capacity, and on certain games, they'll certainly fill that. So that is the, the largest that we get involved with. Um, for the USGA, the USD Open, the US Open, I'm sorry, we will typically screen 250,000 people over the course of the um, over the course of the event. Typically in the neighborhood of, you know, the biggest days are right around 60,000 or so. Um, for an average baseball game, we're typically screening between 35 and, and 45,000 people in a day. Um, you know, it really depends on, on the venue um, and, the, and the seating capacity, really. I, you know, I think most people nowadays, they see security screening as a, as a normal procedure when they're going to any, uh, any event. Um, are, are there things that uh, someone should know about bringing personal items to an event? Is there some things that you, like tips that you give out to people of what can be brought and, and what cannot be brought? Or is that just, is that always based upon the event? It's always based upon the event and the event organizer, what they want to allow in, what they do not want to allow in. Um, so we just did the Monterey County Fair last week. Um, for that event, we'll allow in larger bags. We'll also allow it in, you know, some more food for you know infants, medical needs, and that kind of thing. Um, the event organizer just needs to understand that the more stuff that people are allowed to bring in, the longer the search process is going to take. So if they want to get people in quickly, they should limit the amount of the amount of stuff that people can bring. Um, you know, it also depends on, for example, whether or not they're going to have food sales or alcohol sales inside. There's a lot of variables that go into planning how you're going to run your screening. It sounds like there's a lot of logistics around this, I mean, based upon the different events. And and I'm, I'm guessing when people come to the event, is, is there signage um, indicating what they can and can't bring? I'm, I'm sure that's probably pretty standard. Well, it should be. So what we always recommend to our, our clients is that by any means that they're selling a ticket, they also communicate the prohibited items. Um, therefore, so people will, will know. So it should be posted on the website. It, it should be included in any tickets that are that are mailed. Um, it, there should be signage out in front of the event um, and so forth. One of the nice things about the U.S. Open is it's printed on the back of every ticket. So if somebody has, a, has an issue, they have a concern, oh, I didn't know I couldn't bring that, we ask them just to turn over their ticket. We can show them on the back of the ticket. Um, that makes it extremely um, easy for you know, us to defuse situations where somebody might be upset about not being able to bring an item into the venue. You know, here at the College of DuPage, we always, we're always looking to, you know, have our students succeed in whichever field that they're, they're, they're choosing to go into. And, and I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, Dave, based on the business side of, of security screening, 
if someone decided that they wanted to do this type of work um, as a career, what type of education would they would they need? Is there something specific that they should be focused on? Not necessarily. The one thing that I would say is if you're going to move into private security as a, as a career, I would also get a general understanding of accounting. Um, there will be, you know, we'll need to worry about establishing your billing rates, your, you know, invoicing, um, accounts receivable, all of that stuff needs to be paid, at, you know, paid attention to. So just having a general understanding of accounting practices, if you're going to be in private security, um, whether you're running a screening operation or, um, you know, a security department for a Fortune 500 company, having an understanding of accounting principles is going to be uh, is going to be very handy. And that makes a lot of sense, um, accounting. I see that as a as a uh, uh, kind of a, a a career piece for a lot of different jobs. Um, what about internships in, in, in your company with Andy Frain? Are, are there internships available for people that may want to get some experience in this area? Yes, there are. Um, I actually um, had served an internship 20, you know, almost 30 years ago now. Um, and I accept interns every spring, summer, and, and fall as well. You know, talking about Andy Frain, and, and I'm kind of curious from from my perspective because you know, as a kid, I grew, I grew up in Chicago. I used to go to you know Cubs games and, and and Bulls games when I was a little kid and stuff. Andy Frain was always there. I think there were like ushers at that time. But um, right from your perspective, what is what has changed in the Andy Frain company from back in the you know '60s or, or you know early '70s when when I when I was a youth? Uh, what has changed with the company? Since then until now, what have, what have you seen, Dave, over the over the time that you've been with Andy Frain in terms of changes? Well, there's a significant amount of, of changes, just many of them pertaining to the industry itself. Um, back in the 70s, Andy Frain actually started conducting screening at the airport. So many people, you know, may not realize they see TSA at an at an airport checkpoint now. Uh, but for a long time, that was all privately contracted. And so Andy Frain was providing uh, airport screeners for United Airlines across the country for a, for a long time. Um, and back then, you didn't necessarily have to have a security license in order to, to do security work. Now, depending on the state that you're operating in, you're, you are required to have security licenses. So that's probably the biggest change is the is the state by state approach to to licensing and certification of security officers. Uh, as you pointed out, you know we all started off as as, as ushers, and that's what we were probably best known for. Um, today, many of those positions would be considered security positions uh, by the you know by the individual state. But that's probably the the, the biggest change is the overall regulation. Um, we do screening you know, in accordance with the Certified Cargo Screening Program through the Transportation Security Administration, uh, meaning that we screen anything that goes onto commercial aircraft, anything that's bigger than a Coke can that's going to go onto a commercial aircraft. We'll go through a screening process that is very heavily regulated uh, by the TSA. Um, and then when we do an event like this as well, or anybody in a security position also is required to have a security license and that's regulated by the state. Okay. Well, that's interesting and it's good to know for people that may be interested in, in, in this uh, field as a career. Um, Dave, a quick question for you that I had as I was thinking about security screening, I just, I, you know, I just, I, I figured I, I, I had to, you know, ask in terms of, is, is there, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen someone try to bring in to a sporting, to any event? I mean, is there one thing that stands out where you're like, wow, what are you, what are you thinking? Um, not offhand. But we have seen, you know, when we when we conduct security screening with X-rays for these international package companies, um, our screeners have, for example, found um, handguns that were being smuggled to the Caribbean inside of microwave ovens. Wow. Um, so that was one of the things that kind of kind of stands out. Um, but you know, there are there are other things that are that are that are odd, but nothing that comes to mind at the moment. Okay, I was I was, I was curious when we were, when I was preparing to to talk to you today. Um, so you'll be teaching a class at the Homeland Security Training Institute at College of DuPage on Monday, September sixteenth, which is called Effective Security Screening for Special Events. I know that's a popular class. There's still opportunities for people to, to register for that class, which I'll talk about at the end of the interview. But I wanted to talk a little bit about that class, Dave. 
Um, and we really do appreciate, you know, you coming on board to teach it because obviously you, you have tremendous experience in, in that field. Um, a couple questions about the class. What will students learn by taking this class from your perspective? We're going to talk about planning, developing, implementing, and managing a screening program. So if somebody does not have a current screening program, we're going to you know, give them all the, the, the considerations that they need to have to actually develop one. Um, if they have a current program, we're going to give them all the considerations and benchmarks that they need to assess the effectiveness of their current program so that they can um, improve upon it if necessary. It sounds to me like it will be a, a particularly interesting class. And, and are there any course prerequisites for people that want to sign up for this class? Meaning, if I'm just a person who's interested in it, should I be signing up? Or is it more geared toward people who are, are working in the in that industry? Uh, there is really no pre you know, prerequisite for taking the class. Um, I would suggest that anybody that is in a security or law enforcement um, capacity that is, you know, has some responsibility or their organization is considering um, implementing screening comes through the class because it'll give them more things to, to, to think about, um, you know, with regard to, again, planning, um, implementing, managing, testing, and so forth um, of, the, uh, of, of the program. So this program is a, is a one-day class. And I was curious if there's uh, Im- like important takeaways for somebody who maybe is already working in this field um, could be taking away from this class. Are there any important takeaways for people that may already have experience in security screening, Dave? Sure. So we're going to, again, you know, we'll go through all of the, you know, the considerations for, for, for planning to including to include, you know, the type of equipment, considerations for that equipment, um, communicating, staffing, uh, layout of a, of a screening area, um, testing, training of, of, of staff. We're also going to actually physically train them on you know, how to use the handheld metal tester, the, the walk-through metal detector, uh, bag search, and pat down, and, and so forth. Um, they may be familiar with you know, how they do it in their organization. We will show them how we do it in ours. Uh, that gives them, again, kind of a benchmark to assess the, uh, the overall effectiveness of theirs, see if they want to change anything with how they do it, if, they're, if they've got one, if they don't have one. It gives them a starting point for evaluating how they want to go about doing it. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a great experience for people that have limited experience and people that have a lot of experience. So I, I think that that's a great, a great opportunity for them. I know this course, Dave, is based on Safety Act Certified Principles of Effectiveness and Industry Best Practices. Can you bri- yeah. briefly talk to our listeners uh, a little about the Safety Act and what that is? Okay, so the Safety Act came about after the uh, terrible events of September 11th, 2001. Uh, The federal government realized that if companies could be sued for an act of terrorism, then nobody was going to invest in anti-terrorism. So they came up with the Supporting Anti-Terrorism by Fostering Effective Technology, or Safety Act. Um, Under the Safety Act, they are looking for qualified anti-terrorism technologies. Those technologies can either be Um, an actual product or technology like a handheld metal detector or an x-ray, or it can be a service. And it varies from, you know, each description of the qualified anti-terrorism technology varies from vendor to vendor to vendor to vendor. And basically what it allows you to do is once you have uh, received designation, which means that the Department of Homeland Security is highly confident that your technology is effective against terrorism, um, once you've got that designation, it kind of caps your liability to the amount of the insurance required by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, if they give you a certification, that means that they believe that your technology is not only effective against terrorism, but they're highly confident that it will continue to be effective over time. Um, the Department of Homeland Security will come in. They will assess everything about your, um, about your technology. So for us, for example, it has to do with the, the vetting or the backgrounds of our training of our security officers, uh, the training of our security officers, the implementation of the what we refer to as a screening operations guide or, or a checkpoint operations guide or COG. Um, and when you have a safety act technology and there is an act of terrorism, again, your liability is capped. But that liability protection also for lends itself to the 
um, to the buyer, the purchaser of that as well. So anybody that, for example, uses a Safety Act certified service, they are then also covered by that, uh, by that um, certification. So for example, you'll find um, that Major League Baseball, for example, is Safety Act certified. They're now working on getting each of their individual um, teams Safety Act certified as well. Those teams, when they're going out and they're purchasing services, they're also looking for Safety Act certified um, services because though those layers of protection are kind of built up. So is this class then, would this class be something that could be certified by the Safety Act um, either now or in the future? I believe so. We'd have to take a look at exactly how to do it, but uh, I do not see why not based on some of the uh, qualified anti-terrorism technologies that I've seen out there. Anybody interested in looking more into the Safety Act can go to safetyact.gov. So that's S-A-F-E-T-Y-A-C-T dot G-O-V. And they can find anything there. And if they're interested in looking up a particular company or a product, they can run a search and it'll show them the description of that qualified anti-terrorism technology. It sounds like a great resource for our listeners that want to get more information on this. And again, that's, as Dave said, safetyact.gov. And if you go to that website, uh, it sounds to me like you'll be able to get a lot of great information. So I think that people who are interested in, in this career or interested in exactly what the Safety Act is, it sounds like that's one-stop shopping uh, for a place to go. Is that correct, Dave? That is correct. So, Dave, I, we're kind of coming to the end of the of the uh, podcast, but I also wanted to give you the opportunity, if there's anything else that you want to put out there, um, again, your class is on Monday, September 16th. If I'm if I'm flipping around the HSTI website and I'm just looking at classes, what would you say to me as someone if I'm trying to decide if I should take that course or not? Well, obviously, I'd, I'd encourage you to do it because um, I don't think there's enough understanding or awareness um, about how to, again, design, implement, you know, a, a screening program. Uh, if you went out and bought metal detectors, you went out and bought x-ray, typically they'll train you on the operation, but they won't give you uh, a lot of training about how to integrate that into your overall security program or your security plan. They won't actually train your employees on what to look for and why they're looking for it. Um, they will teach you the operation of the of the equipment, but they won't, again, you know, assist you in how to, op- to incorporate that into your overall security program. Well, Dave, I want to thank you for your time uh, and appearance on the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. It's a uh, it's a very interesting world in which you operate in terms of uh, security screening, and you know we we haven't really had a a show where we've talked about that. So I, I really do appreciate your time. We look forward to having you here at the College of DuPage on September sixteenth, and the class again is effective security screening for specialty events. And I'll give you information before I close um, on, on our website where you can get information. But Dave, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you here in a couple of weeks and uh, best of luck with the NFL experience tonight. Thank you very much. So for more information on this class, which is Effective Security Screening for Special Events, or to register for the class, go to our website at www.cod.edu backslash HSTI. And of course, HSTI always stands for the Homeland Security Training Institute. We want to thank you for joining us on the podcast today, and we look forward to having you join us for further podcasts coming up. So thank you very much.